It was a great flight, and uh, you got some good pilots there flying. And, 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 and they know how to handle the airplane, and I certainly enjoyed it. And uh, I've seen a lot of B-17s, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to fly one. This is the first time. What and did I you thank fly? Thank you all for that. What did you fly in in World War II? I flew in uh, Douglas Dauntless dive bombers and uh, B-25s. I was overseas for 33 months, New Guinea. And you had a good time on this flight? This was a good flight and I enjoyed the opportunity of seeing you folks and uh, know that things are being carried on. My name is Howard McDonald and I was in the 8th Bomb Squadron of the 3rd Bomb Group of the 5th Airplane. This aircraft is operated by the Liberty Foundation, so uh, our charter was basically an aircraft flying, um, B-17 specifically. It's our founder, his father was a tail gunner in the original Liberty Bell B-17. So uh, our goal was to get an airplane flying and to take it to Europe, which we were able to do that in 2008. Do the North Atlantic crossing, which was just incredible. And uh, we're here this weekend with the Memphis Bell, and hopefully people will come out and take the ultimate ride and get the ultimate history lesson. Other than the movie, what is, what is the history of this aircraft? Uh, most of the flying B-17s ended up going into some civil service like ant spraying or fire bombing and that's what this aircraft was, it was a Bore 8 bomber for, for fire suppression and uh, it was highly modified for that and uh, a collector bought it uh, in, before 1990 and uh, he at one time was one of the largest air forces in the world, as a private collector, his name was David Talashay uh, and uh, amazingly enough he was a bomber on uh, World War II, he was a co-pilot with the 100th, the bloody 100th, so he had a passion for airplanes and uh, this was obviously his favorite airplane and he actually ended up getting this airplane flying and for the movie the Memphis Bell. But I, I've been fairly lucky. I mean, I started even in high school. I had a washing business, so I would go wash any airplane. I didn't care what type it was to go fly in it. And uh, one of them just happened to be a Japanese Kate torpedo bomber that a guy owned. And, and fortunately for me, he had a medical issue and he lost his medical. So I, I had a tailwheel endorsement, a high performance sign off and a Cessna, but it made me legal to fly his airplane to make him legal to go fly. So that kind of was the entry into it. And so uh, I tell everybody it's my cunning skill as a pilot, but it's just dumb luck when I was young to get involved. And then I got involved with different museums. So people get involved with like the Liberty Foundation or the Commemorative Air Force. And it gives them the ability, you know, most people like us, we're, you know, I'm one of the poor people get to go fly fun airplanes. So unless you have a whole lot of money and go buy one, this is a way for people to get involved and to come out and keep these airplanes flying. And, you know, again, if we get thousands that have a little bit of money, we can do the same thing with that very few individuals do with a lot of money. So, uh, and, and that's our deal. I mean, uh, it'll be a sad day when we have to park these and not fly them anymore. You said earlier that you were part of the, the team that flew it to Europe. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Yeah, I was uh, lucky to be in the left seat for the whole way. So I was the aircraft commander to take that. And we did the original route that they did in World War II. So I started uh, and went into uh, Canada, into Narsarsawak, Greenland, into Iceland, Reykjavik, Iceland, into Prestwick, Scotland, and then into Duxford on July 4th. So that was pretty amazing. In the war, they'd actually bypass going across Greenland because they had the fuel. And we didn't quite have the fuel to go all the way now without the long range. The original bases, um, the control towers are still there, and you can see the where the base outline was, typically the roads that run around. And I had a World War II veteran that did it in 1944, went over, and we went over and he buzzed his uh, tower over there in Lavingham, England. So to have him in the seat and to do that, I mean, again, out of all of my aviation career, you know, that's stuff I'll look back on, and uh, uh, it was just an incredible experience. And they did a documentary, it's called The Yanks Are Back, so they filmed the whole thing going over, and again, uh, you know, just great to be a part of it. Is there any other memorable stories from this plane besides that, or that, that kind of takes the cake? Uh, every, every day I get a memorable story to fly this airplane. And it's not just, it's not really about us, it's really about the people that flew them in World War II. So again, to have these guys come out, the youngest one is the early uh, 90s, uh, especially if they were in a command seat as an officer there. They may be in their mid-90s, and uh, again, we, we love having them out. They're getting fewer and fewer to come out and hear their stories. and. Uh, you know, a lot of those guys never documented any of their stories. They take them with them. So we, we want to ask them uh, so people can't rewrite history. We want to get it right from their uh, their mouth. And uh, it's just amazing what they did for our freedom. So I, I hope we never ever do it again. I, I don't know if our generation would do what their generation did for, for us. It's just amazing.